Speaking of AGU, I know you started off asking about environmental health, and I know that's been an interest of mine. Uh, AGU has the, and perhaps some of you are in it, uh, the GeoHealth group, and I get those emails. And uh, there's, there's definitely been some health-related climate change impacts, both in local communities from air quality issues or other um, you know, social justice issues uh, that AGU has put out throughout the last year and had various presentations about. Um, and you know, it's definitely a really key issue. I'm really interested in particulate matter and I live in Fairbanks, which has the worst air quality in the US in the wintertime. So- Why is that? Well, we have uh, severe temperature inversions. Mm. So, you know, we'll, we get ice fog um, and that ice fog, those ice crystals have absorbed onto them all the particulates that are just stuck in mm -hmm. the atmosphere because it can't go anywhere. Uh, so basically we get this toxic air in the winter mm. and you know, people, I, I've got asthma. So I knew when I was moving here that I wanted to move above the inversion and I could afford to do so, thankfully. But most people who, you know, might have health impacts can't, can't, you know, move. <laughs> so they're where they are, uh, breathing this toxic smog. Mm. Wow. So we can actually, I'm really interested in doing snow. I, I we do a lot of how, ba how bad work. is it? Is it, can you, can, can people walk around outside? I mean, if they're, if they don't have asthma or is it something that you have to wear um, some kind of filters in order to walk around outside? Yeah. So it's, it's often hazardous, you know, with the um, air quality index in the hazardous categories uh, because of that uh, there where wood stoves are being banned, which of course, you're in Alaska, you need heat. So those are tough, tough things. So yes, it can be hazardous. Um, I think maybe face masks can be a good thing <laughs> this winter. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, that's a great question. I'm really interested in, um, and I've been part of uh, citizen science work with when I was a teacher in Montana, uh, my students were doing PM 2.5 studies along with a uh, program that's in Alaska, Idaho, and Montana. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, uh, it's called the REACH program through the University of Montana. And it has lots of curriculum with it, but students are designing their own research questions. And I'll put a link in the chat uh, for that. Um, and so now I'm, now that I do this globe citizen science, I want to link the PM 2.5 air quality work with snow um, and start studying black carbon in snow. Uh, and we can figure out what's in the air, what shows up in the snow, that'll be eventually be in the water. So um, it's kind of a neat, yeah, neat it is. connection. So it actually ties into one of the part of the, the teacher professional development program that I'm looking to pilot at some point, really tries to focus the teachers on developing curriculum around the local issues um, that the community is dealing with. And that sounds like a perfect one. It, it actually touches on so many aspects of your system. It really is, must be really, um, really interesting. Well, enough from hearing from me, there's lots of other people on the call. Eric, you're the one like next on my screen. And then there's Emily. Sure, hi, hi everyone. Sorry, I was a little late jumping on this morning. Um, yeah, um, I, one of the projects I've been thinking about working on that maybe connects to the idea of local and even health, back to that conversation about health, um, is sort of, I, I, I'm from the Bay Area in California, uh, Oakland, and sort of telling the stories, on the ground stories of how folks are working towards sustainability, sort of building sustainability. Um, so a couple examples in Oakland that I've been starting to research a little bit. Uh, one is this, uh, there's a number of urban gardens and urban farming going on um, right now in the area, both at schools, but also within the community. Uh, City Slickers Farm, City Slicker Farms, for example, is a, a group that's doing a lot of the community-based urban gardening. And uh, I sit on a, a local recycling board, the county board, Alameda County uh, Waste Management Recycling Board. So we had a great presentation a couple months ago uh, about 
not just urban farming, but the, using it as a means to sequester carbon. So they're referring to it as carbon farming. Um, mm -hmm. And it's part of this, at California has a new bill that was just passed 1383. Mm -hmm. One of the things in the bill is that, that uh, jurisdictions need to start dealing with their, their green waste uh, locally. So the idea is, you know, you put your green waste, your organics, if you don't have a home, home composting system, you put them in the green bin and they get shipped somewhere an hour away to a big you know composting facility it gets composted and then redistributed possibly sold to, to folks that want the compost but with this one the idea is that it stays closer to home i think um that you would you know maybe take this green waste and it, it could be deposited somewhere within that city let's say within oakland uh, on an urban farm uh, composted on site and then and then used to both enrich the soil and sequester carbon at the same time. So this group was looking at even uh, this presentation we got was quant trying to quantify that, you know, trying yeah. to So do you know how much carbon might be sequestered when you're in, in an urban farm? Um, it, it wasn't enough to offset all of the emissions of the population. I know that. I don't know. Um, I don't know the details. This was sort of a new, I mean, I've been reading and learning about the idea of carbon sequestration as a huge uh, mitigation tool for, for getting, you know, like Project Drawdown has talked about this um, quite a bit as one of the many solutions that they've sort of quantified. Um, and I think they're in an urban setting. I don't know how much potential. W w there was a study that UC Berkeley did, a couple of students, grad students, 10 years ago that just looked at the physical capacity of Oakland to do urban farming. So how many open spaces were there? if you converted those to agriculture or even potentially livestock, what's the potential? It wasn't enough to feed everybody in the city, but, um, but it, you know, I think the idea is getting people back closer to the land, taking care of, you know, um, their urban spaces, creating more green spaces, because Oakland has a lot of green space deserts, you know, um, in certain areas, but it also actually, have a lot, quite a bit of open space too. For, for an urban area, Alameda and Contra Costa County actually have significant parklands and you know, designated urban space. So anyway, I think just kind of the idea I have is to just really look at very specific case studies and interweave the idea of cultural relevancy too, because this one of the gardens is in a largely African American community and they've taken a piece of a city park and turned it into an urban garden. So. There's also another another site that I'm really interested in, in a largely Latino part of Oakland. The neat thing about Oakland is it's a microcosm, so many diverse groups there and so many things happening. But to tell those studies and then share them across, you know, cities, counties, across the country, or even internationally, I think could be really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, well, well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Any other thoughts about uh, ways of integrating these kinds of topics into stu you know, student educational um, opportunities? One of the thing that, um, good morning everyone. I'm Tiffany with Classrooms for Climate Action. Hi Emily, hi Eric, hi Christy. Um, one of the things that we've been doing, I think uh, Christy was just talking about bringing together um, communities with schools and we have a local bag tax that's on our ballot here in Louisville, Colorado right now. So we have basically been a student-led campaign. So the students are hosting virtual town halls and handing out the flyers and writing letters to the editor and made the signs and so it's been a great um, climate action bridge between a municipal issue and the, and the schools and the kids and the town. So um, yeah, I just wanted to share that success. It's been going really well and just kind of in the spirit of uh, Mark McCaffrey and his colleagues paper on Sweet Spot, right? It's the small towns, local action that show this is the, the biggest impact for, you know, gigatons of carbon being pulled out of the atmosphere is this, these small local actions. So. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been fun to put forward uh, youth voices and have the kids really lead the charge on the campaign. And um, so yeah, kind of a, 
a nice success story there. Nice. And I think it's going to pass. <laughs> Great. Emily? Thanks. Um, so Eric and Tiffany, um, I saw some micro grants for science communication come through this morning. I don't know if it's useful or not, but I popped it into the chat just in case. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emily. Not to, not to overly talk, but I, the student connection too, I, the, one of the intriguing um, things is happening, Castlemont High School, which is in East Oakland and um, has an urban farm that they're actually, so I think, I was thinking along the same lines of what you're all saying uh, tomorrow, what you're asked about, like, if the students could get out and create these case study documentation, you know, document these case studies and starting right at the high school, if they could videotape, tell the story of their urban farm. Um, I really like that idea of the students leading the mm -hmm. charge too. Very nice. And thanks Emily for the micro grant. I'll check that out. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Either about these this, this, uh, curriculum ideas with students and communities or about professional meetings being virtual, the two topics we've been touching on. My computer crashed in the middle of me saying something, but I don't remember what it was I was saying. So. Yeah, I don't either. You just all of a sudden froze like this. <laughs> Yeah, well, I have a new computer that I started using last week on Monday, and it just like turned off in the middle of the call, which was really <laughs> strange. So that's a good sign, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think I'm good. And you know, I mean, it's one of those, this is the third, we didn't end up with a presentation in the clean call that we normally would have had last week we had another mm. informal discussion so i do wonder if we're just a little bit like wow talked out <laughs> from three f clean calls that have okay. informal discussions but oh. okay it's not really all that important but uh the one of the teams that i work on uh presented you were talking about virtual meetings uh the international society of exposure sciences was held virtually about like a week and a half ago and um, our team presented there um, just to try to cross connect those fields and we have video from that that one of my colleagues should be posting soon well i'll like make an announcement when we eventually get it up oh um, great yeah well the other activity that I, I mentioned just briefly before was the uh enroads climate solutions workshop i've done a workshop for clean for the teacher webinars um, and then there's a, another one we planned in january um, but I'm doing them for other, other kinds of groups too. So if anybody is interested. So En-ROADS is an energy rapid overview and support model so that you can really explore different kinds of solutions and see what their impact is on uh, keeping uh, the temperatures by 2100, no more than two degrees above, uh, above pre-industrial levels. So it really, it really does show, it really demonstrates in a very concrete way how um, there's not one silver bullet. You're not going to solve it with one solution. That it takes a, a spectrum of solutions and act, and also there could be various combinations of different solutions that can get you there. But it does take a global effort. Um, it can't be any one group, any one community. It has to be all different communities pitching in to really address the, address the issue. The other piece that the model really makes clear and it's sometimes hard for people to understand is the systems nature of climate change. So you know, there's a lot of attention paid to the drawdown book and it's, a, it's an excellent, and it's an excellent book to provide all kinds of solutions to climate change. But each of those solutions is considered by itself. And the sum of all those solutions is, it, if you implement all those solutions, the resulting impact is not the sum of them individually that there's a systems aspect to this in which there's overlapping um, impacts and overlapping um, advantages and disadvantages. And the model also allows you to consider what the co-benefits are, things that don't actually contribute to climate change, but in, in uh, impact environmental quality. Um, and so, and, and also the other aspect that's explored in the model is equity issues. And you can't just keep taxing the hell out of, out of uh, carbon emissions 
without considering its impact on those uh, communities that really can't afford the, the higher costs. So it's a very powerful model. Um, and so I encourage anybody to, to, I'll actually put the URL for the, uh, for the uh, model into the chat and you can play with it yourself. I actually use it with my students. Tamara, I, I want to say just particular thanks for the point about how interrelated the pieces are and how, how the coordination between the different pieces is multiplicative. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really good point. It, it, it is, and it's really important because most people can't really hold in their heads how multiple kinds of solutions will come out the other end. You know, how, what, what will the joint impact be? And the model allows you to explore that without, without you, the individual, having to keep that all in your head. Well, there's three of us from Alaska who signed up for the training. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> because that's a huge issue out here uh, with, you know, looking at energy solutions, renewable mm -hmm. energy solutions. I mean, the very most energy efficiency is going to be the first thing that people need to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're, you know, got negative temperatures, um, so important to find ways to, you know, keep that heat in your home. Right. But mm -hmm. that's not necessarily what's exciting and what, you know, what it's also the other piece of that and I've seen this brought up before is that yes you need to keep that heat in your, in your home but you can't have your home so well insulated right. that all of the toxins can't can't get out you know so mm -hmm. there needs, still needs to be some kind of exchange so figuring out that balance is critical yeah it's really hard it's, we just spent two grand redoing our whole hrv heat recovery mm. ventilation system and putting in air filters and mm. and yet it's not and we put in solar panels we just got uh you know 24 solar panels and of course those aren't going to be generating in the winter because it's dark right. <laughs> so when is, when is the actual season for when solar panels are generating when well is it? we'll still generate an hour um even on the longest date, you know, short on December 21st, we'll still generate an hour. Um, so oh, that's really? good. Yeah, that's good. Uh, right now we're getting about, um, we're getting about 20 kilowatt hours on our solar panels. Mm -hmm. But you know, our, our energy rates here, um, it's about what, 39 cents a kilowatt hour, way mm -hmm. more than what most people pay. In the mm -hmm. So it makes sense financially, we're going to pay them off sooner. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting now in Alaska in, in Renewable Energy Alaska Project, which is part of REAP also, or excuse me, REAP, which is part of CLEAN also, and that's, uh, th we collaborate with that group. Um, they're part of now using solar uh, to pump water and basically store the water as a battery so that in the wintertime that hydro you can generate you know, mm -hmm. electricity from hydro, but you can pump the water up to some, it doesn't have to be a reservoir, it could be some sort of other storage uh, that doesn't freeze. So mm -hmm. there, there's really neat options like that. Yet, if you don't solve the efficiency problems first, um, right, and just invest in that, you know, you're, you're wasting energy and money. Mm hmm. Okay, any other thoughts or comments? I don't know if it's really, it's kind of related to Christy, but oh, yeah. no, no, you go ahead, go ahead, Tiffany. Well, I was just gonna say, just to reinforce what Emily just said, I'm on the Louisville Sustainability um, Advisory Board here, and our, um, our specialist, she always says that efficiency is the main dish and um, renewable energy is the dessert, and we have to. <laughs> We have to deal with the main dish first, and a lot of places just want to skip to the sexy adaptations of renewable or solar or wind or whatever, mm -hmm. without making sure the efficiency is dealt with. So that's kind of the, the city mantra when we're looking at the efficiency of uh, the municipal buildings and all the, the things we have to do, so. That's a nice way of making it clear. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Eric, sorry. No, that was actually totally related to what I was thinking too. It's funny you said that because, uh, you know, Gavin Newsom just, and our governor said, uh, 
you know, no more gas powered cars by 2035 uh, or no more production of. And then, you know, I'm on Facebook with my whole array of left, middle and right leaning friends and hearing the dialogue. And one of my uh, more conservative friends was saying, you know, rightfully so, well, what about all the waste that's produced and all the resources we need to create renewable energy technologies, you know, the, the, the precious metals and the things that are you know, being mined down in Chile, for example, and the fact that we can't even domestically nearly produce enough of that stuff here. And so China's kind of cornered the market on some of these things. And, um, but it was to your point, Tiffany, like it's California's success stories has been an efficiency. You know, we've, despite population growth, been able to kind of keep our, a lot of our energy use flat you know, which is amazing and, and other states haven't necessarily engaged in that. So there's, it's like the super low hanging fruit, the energy you don't, use, you don't use is the energy you don't need to create, you know, so 100% agree. And then being on this county board, um, kind of in a related vein, we're going through our strategic planning now for the county, but they do it every two years on this board. But the idea is the sort of the goalpost is to create a, a vision of, of uh, landfills being obsolete, you know, the idea of a circular economy, the idea of no waste. Um, so, you know, efficiency, of course, is at the very top of that, uh, that, that hierarchy. And then you kind of move through like the reuse and oh, the recycling is all really at the bottom, you know, because that's uh, just, it's still resource intensive and challenging. Um, so anyway, just made me think of that. But, but, and then I just was curious what you all think about renewable technologies and, you know, the waste that, that is produced and the resources that are required. Because I think about one of the challenges, I taught 22 years in a science museum, and we would talk about renewables not being perfect. You know, we talk, we talk about energy and fossil fuels being a problem, but renewables aren't perfect. And could students envision creating a solar panel that was actually truly recyclable at the end of life or a wind turbine? Because wind turbines and the blades use composite, you know, carbon fiber stuff that gets landfilled afterwards. These are huge pieces of trash and they don't have a way of recycling them. So there's definitely a lot of work to be done within the re renewable sphere to think about closing the loop and, and not having garbage created or resources being harvested from the earth. But anyway, just so, I was just curious about your thoughts on some of that stuff. I think that's one of the things when we think about um, climate education and kids are really good about this is looking at multiple stakeholders in terms of all all points on the supply chain right so you're thinking about because um, a lot of the kids are our bag tax that the kids are kind of fighting for right now is paper and plastic so they did a lot of research on you know the trees on upstream and then the non decomposing plastic at the other end and you know, everything, and, and that's where equity and climate come together, right? You think about the, the silicon, uh, silica farming that's happening in Bolivia and the decimation of a lot of that land and, and really embedding all of the stakeholders, um, the people, the planet, and everything along the way. I think that in and of itself is a great model for, for climate education and getting kids to look through the lens of every single point along from the from where the natural resource is coming from to what happens to that wind turbine when it's when it's at the end of its life and what can it become and you know that's where the that's where the stewardship and the innovation can stem from when you're looking mm -hmm. at like you said soup to nuts eric the whole picture right mm -hmm. yeah that's that's really interesting. I mean, I've always thought that, you know, people talk about switching to electrification of things, but then the energy has, but that has to come from somewhere. And so what is, what is that cost? Um, so it's another avenue that needs to be continuously explored. Okay, any other thoughts or comments? Did you all see the Earthshot thing uh, that Prince William is kind of put out there? It was no, just, what's that? It's a new, it's supposed to be modeled after the moonshot, the idea of mm -hmm. getting you know, astronauts to the moon in the 10 year period in the 60s that Kennedy kind of threw out there. Well, this is 
Prince William saying we want to do an earth shot. These are million dollar grants that will be doled out over 10 years, I believe. And there's five different categories. One of them is you know, trying to solve climate change. Another one is like waste. And there's three others I can't remember, but it, it's supposedly going to go out in November. It's, it's a UN kind of organized program. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, so it's, if you all are interested, it sounded really like a neat, neat idea. Do you have a link to that, Eric? You can throw in the chat or? Um, I'll find it, yeah. It's UN program, so I'm sure if you just, yeah, but I'll, I'll find it. And it's, they, they are, the whole request for proposals hasn't quite gone out. So I think it's sort of, I'll put an article. I was reading a couple articles about it, but sure. Great, thank you. I know that right before COVID, um, uh, oh, I just found Amazon dude, old guy, owner of Amazon. Um, I just drew a blank. Bezos? Yeah, Bezos. Yeah, so right before COVID, he was going to come out with like these, you know, billion dollar of climate education grant money. And I don't know whatever happened to that, but that was, that was like right before COVID, he was going to put a lot of money into climate. I'm not sure what happened with that. I read something about it recently. He's got you know, some foundation he's setting up to deal with the, so I, I don't think it's actually going to go to many people, to be honest with you. It just, <laughs> it just, the way, I can't even remember, it was a few weeks ago I read an article, but yeah, it just seemed like he's just kind of, I'm sure some of it will trickle down and be useful in some regard, but it seemed, the way that I read about it, it seems like he's kind of using it as more of a front to kind of, you know, as they all do, funnel money through these foundations to help themselves more than to help other people. Um, so that was part of it, but then also just kind of, um, I think an outward facing, like, hey, I'm doing this, and then what are you actually doing? I don't know. I mean, they're supposedly setting it up <laughs> and working on it, but. It, I wasn't super impressed with how they were doing it when I read about it, so. Yeah, it's funny, another article I just, it's a friend posted on Facebook um, was what happens to the returns from Amazon. And there's these, apparently this is about return centered in Canada, I think near Ontario, in Ontario or something. But it's like, I think the stat was like 40% of stuff gets returned or something. And a lot of it gets just, a landfill, even if it's a perfectly good product, you know, so I feel like Katie, to your point, like Bezos is sort of, you know, just trying to play catch up and kind of, you know, because people have been pushing him on the climate stuff and he's more reactionary than visionary. Exactly. And I think it's partly that just to, you know, make it seem like, oh, Amazon's doing things. It's the same with, um, there's the new, I'm from Seattle, so there's a new stadium there that the hockey team's going to start, the new hockey team's going to start playing in next year, and it's the um, funded by this group. That's part of why I read about this, because the his climate foundation is, like, the sponsor for that stadium, so it's literally called the, like, what was it? It's like climate action or climate solution, something like climate pledge. That's what it's called. It's called the climate pledge, like arena or whatever. Um, and I forget what I was saying about that. Yeah, it just seems to be honest a little bit like it's this outward facing, like, hey, we're doing good on climate, like still keep using Amazon, even though it destroys the climate. Like, you know, <laughs> like, this is what it feels like. It feels a little bit like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm not bad on climate. You know, it just feels a little bit like that kind of, what do you call it? The facade they call it more than green, the greenwashing. It's, it's in the business world. It's called greenwashing. Yeah. Make it look like you're doing something when you're not. Yeah. That's what it feels like to me. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts? I'll just share one more project real quick we're working on as we exit here that I was excited because you were talking about jobs and youth and it made me think about this. So we have um, a local middle school and we're doing a virtual career fair with them. And the focus is on all careers. So the idea of you don't just need to go into, and no offense to those of you majoring in environmental science, Lauren, um, but you don't just need to go into environmental science to have a lens on stewardship. So it's that idea of whether you're in construction or you're a hairdresser or you're a lawyer, whatever you do, you can examine that 
what we talked about, that kind of soup to nuts part about what is, where is the waste going from what you do? Where, um, just the whole idea of equity and stewardship in all careers. And so, um, yeah, I'll report back. It should be really, really fun. Yeah, that should be really interesting. That is the way to, to capture the whole spectrum of society is to show that no matter what you do, you can have an impact and you can think it through carefully. Yep, and we really, we don't have a choice anymore. Everyone has to have that lens. Um, so I think it's, that's again where I feel like that's an important thing to embed that, you know, kids just don't have to go into STEM to be part of solutions. That Absolutely, every absolutely. Has. Anyway. I'm teaching undergraduate student, undergraduate business students, like none of them are STEM majors and never will be. But I'm hoping to make them see how understanding climate science is, is will be beneficial to their careers. Yeah, you know, that's, I totally agree. Like I it, it, this the conversation around interdisciplinary approach and intergenerational approach, multicultural. I mean, it's such an all encompassing and big area. And one of the things I've been locally working with this um, the Oakland Unified School District. It just um, they're they have this really uh, visionary statement about integration of climate education K twelve articulated across all the grades inter interdisciplinary by design. That's the vision. But they over time in the last ten years, the actual even the science department is like this big now. It used to be like seventeen people, mm. it's like a couple. Really? And so they blended, you know, the STEM is now, all STEM is under one, one leader, I believe. Uh, and then just the idea of how do you, how do you engage like social science teachers in climate? How do you, you, you need like the advocate, or you need somebody, mm -hmm. the pole bearer for it within their, you know, discipline that may, it's not necessarily a priority, right? So mm -hmm. how do you, how do you really do that on the ground um, when, when, and during COVID, it's that much more challenging um, for teachers and, and school districts. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I am, I'm actually gonna have to leave to go to another meeting also. So um, are there any other final comments before we end our call for today? Thank you for having well, the camera. Yeah, um, I'm happy to facilitate today and thanks for all of your input. It was a very interesting conversation. Thank you. And Emily, that, that grant looks awesome. So thanks so much for sharing that. I was just looking at it. So we may, may actually go for it <laughs> with our, my, my group. Well, good luck. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, have a good day. Bye.